Good morning and a very warm welcome to Christchurch Purley and our online services for today, Sunday the 28th of February. It's wonderful to have you with us and a particular welcome to anyone who might be joining us for the first time and we pray that God will really bless you during your time with us uh, and that you'll be able to join with us again next week or in future weeks. This morning we're continuing in our series looking through the Gospel of Luke and today we're concentrating on a part of chapter 17 where Jesus is talking to his disciples about times to come and particularly the time of the coming of the kingdom. But before we start our worship and our praise and our study of God's word, let's spend some time in coming before God and confessing to him all those things that we haven't done right during the week and seeking his forgiveness. So let us pray. Almighty God, long suffering and of great goodness, we confess to you with our whole heart our neglect and forgetfulness of your commandments our wrongdoing, thinking and speaking, the hurts we've done to others and the good that we've left undone. Father God, forgive us and raise us to newness of life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And may the God of love and power forgive you and free you from your sins heal and strengthen you by his spirit and raise you to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. Before the throne of God above I have a strong, a perfect plea a great high priest whose name is love whoever lives and pleads for me my name is written on his hands my name is hidden in his heart i know that one in him he stands no tongue can bid me to depart no tongue can bid me to depart When Satan tempts me to despair And tells me of the guilt within Upwards I look and see him there Who made an end to all my sin Because the sinless Saviour my sinful soul is counted free, for God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me, to look on him and pardon me. Behold him there, the risen Lamb, my perfect spot. Righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One with my Lord, I cannot die. My soul is purchased with his blood. My life is saved with Christ on high, with Christ my Saviour and my with Christ my Saviour and my God One with my Lord, I cannot die My soul is purchased with his blood My life is safe with Christ on high With Christ my Saviour and my God With Christ my Saviour and my God Sounds about 
Luke 17, verses 20 to 37, the coming of the kingdom of God. Once, having been asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the kingdom of God does not come with your careful observation, nor will people say, here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is among you. Then he said to the disciples, the time is coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. Men will tell you, there he is, or here he is. Do not go running after them, for the Son of Man in his day will be like the lightning which flashes and lights up from the sky from one end to the other. But first... He must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulphur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, no one who is on the roof of his house with his goods inside should go down to get them. 
Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, on that night, two people will be in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken and the other left. Where, Lord? they asked. He replied, where there is a dead body, there the vultures will gather. Good morning. Today we're going to continue our series on Luke and last week Simon shared with us about the uh, healing of the ten lepers and how Jesus stepped over the divide of what was exclusive and made it inclusive and brought them in by that healing. And so we pick up the story today as chapter 17 continues. Now I'd like to start by sharing just a couple of stories from when I was a curate, as a trainee vicar, and uh, my very first preach um, was on the story of Jericho. Now Jericho, if you know it, is a great children's story. You go round and round the, uh, the city, blowing the trumpets, and eventually the walls come tumbling down. My problem was that the next part of the story is that the Israelites go into the city and they slaughter everyone. Thanks, Steve, my training incumbent, for that one. And I struggled with this, but I remember distinctly one particular slide that I put up. And in there, I suggested that people struggle with this idea of a God of love or a God of judgment. And I remember saying that he's not a God of love or a God of judgment. He is a God of love and a God of judgment. And we're going to unpack that idea today. Now, uh, a few months later, I was preaching in another church, Holy Trinity Red Hill. And the passage I had was 1 John 4, famous, of course, for God is love. And one of the conclusions I came to in preaching that particular sermon, and it stuck with me ever since, is that if God is love, then that means that every act of God is a loving act. From creation to new creation, the law, the prophets, and of course, the final judgment. So we're going to consider that today, this idea of judgment and the love of God and how we can bring the two together. Now, there's a blog um, called Babylon B, quite a reverent blog. Um, and in it, uh, one time it suggested that somebody had uh, criticized Jesus for not being Christ like enough. All this unloving and problematic teaching about hell and judgment rather than affirming people's sins. Now, the thing about satires, it can be cutting. It's certainly exaggerated, but it's usually based on an ounce of truth. In this case, about the teaching of some in the church today. Now, Jesus certainly taught both about love and about judgment. He also taught that we are called to teach others God's commandments. Matthew 28, go make disciples baptize them and teach them everything I have commanded. But what he doesn't say is to judge, because judgment lies with God. Judge not lest you yourself are judged. So today's passage in Luke 17, uh, before we get into it, I'd like to just go back a few verses to the first five verses of Luke 17, verses 1 to 5. And in there, Jesus sets a context for the discussion he has, particularly with the disciples that we'll see today. 
Things that cause people to sin are bound to come, he says in verse 1. But woe to anyone through whom they come. Sin happens, Jesus is saying. We should highlight it. We should forgive the repentant sinner when they repent, whatever the gravity or the frequency of their sin. But don't, whatever you do, encourage others to sin. It's quite the opposite, because otherwise you yourself will receive the punishment. Jesus is very clear. And then in those verses 11 to 17 that we heard last week, where Jesus heals the ten lepers. And Simon brought us a powerful message. Society had cast them out, and it even became their own assumption that they were in that place. Yet Jesus included and healed them. Too often the church and society has both judged and excluded. An example being the continued pain of exclusion and barriers and oppression felt by black members of the church. We need here to find a space for those stories to be shared and to be heard. And as a first step towards supporting and responding to the experience for our brothers and sisters. Those who have experienced exclusion and oppression. Jesus' message is very clear. All are welcome and valued. It is not our place to judge or to exclude based on who someone is. Their colour, their race, their background, their language, their ability, their gender. If it's based on who they are, then we are not called to exclude. The reading goes on, verse 20 to 21. The Pharisees ask when the kingdom of God is coming. And Jesus replies that it's here, it's come, it's me, it's in your midst. And that's the unique part of this reading to Luke. It then moves on. To something we'll find in Matthew. He turns to the disciples. The setting is different than it is in Matthew, but it's the same message. This judgment is coming. Ignore the false prophets. You won't get an advanced warning, but you will know. Just look in the skies and you will see. And he gives the examples of the flood we find in Genesis 6, and the destruction of Sodom with sulfur and fire, which we find in Genesis 19. Both examples of destruction and judgment through the fact that the people were wicked. They asked the disciples, because Jesus had been talking about one will be taken and others will be left at the final judgment. They say... Where will they be taken? They're interested in the destination. They're interested in the, uh, the reward. And Jesus diverts them back to his main point of what he's trying to say. Be saved. Don't be one of the ones who is left. Be saved. He's speaking to his friends, to the disciples. Though there is a clear message, the kingdom invitation is inclusive. It is to all, but kingdom entry is not universal. Jesus is saying to the disciples, some will not get in. So how can this judgment be from a loving God? Well, I'd just like to share with you a parable. Now, I like golf, but I've been put off joining golf clubs because they can have a bit of a reputation for being both exclusive and expensive. But just imagine this story. 
There was a golf club that opened up in the Surrey Hills and aware of the stigma around the perceived exclusivity of other clubs that had only male members and no foreigners or poor people, the club wanted to be different. It wanted to be inclusive for all. Club fees were set very low. No references were required. One didn't need to be invited or sponsored to join. You just needed to ask to join and you would become a member. All races, genders, abilities were welcome and hundreds and then thousands signed up. All seemed well. Unfortunately, after a while, things started to change. Things started to get damaged. Flag pins were not replaced, meaning that the next group could not see where the hole was on the green. Divots were not replaced, meaning that holes and gouges appeared in the fairway. Inappropriate footwear led to damage to the carefully cultivated greens. Some started to use the course without paying the fee, causing problems with the budget for maintenance. Some players started to shout at others for what they saw as slow play. Some took it into their own hands by taking their turn before the group ahead had safely moved on, even leading to some injuries from golf balls struck in haste. This became so bad that on one very hot day, as tempers frayed, a fight broke out between two foursomes and it spilled out across the whole of the back nine only ceasing once someone had to be taken to hospital after being hit by a very large driver. Some grew bored of golf, but saw the opportunity to play football instead that they identified more closely with. They didn't actually impede anyone else in their play, but playing football was not what the club was set up for by the founders. The club founders decided that this chaos could not go on for any longer. They reaffirmed the rules of golf and asserted that the golf course was only for the game of golf it was intended. The club remained inclusive, fees were very low and long-term commitment was encouraged. But now with a proviso, to remain a member all had to obey the rules that were laid out for the protection and the enjoyment of all. Past offenders would be readmitted so long as they both admitted their past errors and pledged not to do them again and to do their best to abide by the rules of the club as determined by the founders. Anyone who refused to do so lost their access to the golf club. The club remained inclusive. Members were excluded by their own actions and attitudes. Now this is a picture of the kingdom of God. The blog post I referred to earlier may have been an exaggeration, but there is a real problem of making a comfortable God in our own image. God is revealed in scripture and what we see is a God who loves and is love. A love that is self-originating. He does not love us because we are attractive. That being the reason why I love my wife. But because it's who he is. Salvation is conditional on obedience. I read recently Deuteronomy 7 and Deuteronomy 4. Obedience is reminded to the Israelites as they prepared to enter the promised land. Obey the laws that your God has given you. And God cannot live with evil. He cannot allow the unrepentant sinner into paradise any more than we can allow raw sewage into the Sunday roast. In both cases, it would be both spoiled and ruined. So love and judgment. Well, we find this in a very famous place that you probably are very familiar with the first part. 
Maybe not so much with the second. John 3.16. For God loved the world in this way to send his son, that for those who believe in him, they will not perish, but have eternal life. But it goes on in John 3.17 and 18. The son was sent to save the world, not to condemn it. Very clearly states, believe and you're not condemned. Don't believe and you are condemned. Michael Green um, spoke once about four-stage evangelism through the Bible. You can lead somebody through the Bible using an A, B, C, D. Firstly, admit that you are separated from God. Then believe, then consider the cost, the need for repentance, and then do something about it. Give your life to Jesus. But note that the first thing is that you have to admit that you're separated from God. You need to admit the existence of sin, the things that get in the way between our relationship with God and us. God is not an arbitrary judge. Malcolm Green again talks about uh, God sets the exam paper. He gave the answers in scripture and on those tablets. We just need to give the answers or live the life consistent with those preset answers. It's not an arbitrary thing. It's all been laid out for us. And of course, he gives us the tools because he gives us the Holy Spirit to point us in the right direction. Ian Paul, writing about the love of God, wrote this. The credible Christian love that expresses God's love cannot be separated from a credible case for repentance and obedience. So back where we started, Matthew 28, go, make disciples, teach them all I have commanded. The kingdom of God is inclusive and God invites every one of us. We are not excluded because of who we are. But we can exclude ourselves. God judges to keep paradise pure and holy. We are not called to judge, but to teach and to walk with others. And to rebuke means to point to God's will. We, as church together, have a choice to make, a truth to find, and we find it in Scripture. What are God's commands? And we seek the guidance and the direction of the Holy Spirit to grow together daily in obedience, all for his glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus' teaching. And we thank you for Luke and for Matthew for highlighting his teaching about the end times, about his coming again, about the choice that needs to make. Inspire us by your spirit to seek your way. Forgive us when we go the wrong way. Help us to repent. Give us safe knowledge that when we repent, you will forgive us, that you are merciful. And help us not to judge, but to walk with brothers and sisters, that they may be in Christ. And we pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. morning Christchurch. Let's pray. Psalm 67 says, may God be gracious to us and bless us and to make his face shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples with equity 
and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. The land yields its harvest. God, our God, blesses us. May God bless us still, so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. Father God, we pray that through each one of us, your salvation may, will be made known to the ends of the earth. Help us share this wonderful message, not with fear and timidity, but with courage and boldness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. This has been such a difficult year for many of us, and no one has been unaffected by the damage of the pandemic. We thank you that with the vaccine rollout, there is a light at the end of the, this tunnel, but help us to be patient as we wait for more people to be vaccinated and for restrictions to start to lift. We pray for those in our fellowship who have lost loved ones during this year. We ask for your loving arms to reach around them, giving them comfort and hope. Lord, we long to be able to meet again as a fellowship, to worship together in person and to be able to comfort and encourage each other properly. We pray for our children and young people as their education has been disrupted so much and for parents who have been struggling to homeschool as well as holding down a job. In particular, we pray for the mothers who have often carried the pressure on their own and who feel they are really struggling to cope and are close to breaking point. We pray that in the long term, children will not be set back too much and especially help those children who have really lost out and have fallen far behind. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our leaders, for Boris Johnson and his cabinet, as they try and lead us out of lockdown and get the economy going again. We pray for wisdom, integrity and compassion in all the decisions they make. May they not rely on their own strength, but turn to you for guidance and help. We pray for our NHS and give thanks that they have served us so faithfully and with such cost to themselves. We pray that the number of patients in hospitals will come down quickly and that those who have been on the front line will have time to recover from the intense stress and pressure these last months. We pray for their mental as well as their physical well-being. May they be able to process their experience in a healthy, life-affirming way and not be too traumatised by the death of so many people they have been trying to care for. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for other countries where they have little access to good health care. We pray for the medical staff in war-torn countries where they have to cope with horrendous injuries as well as the pandemic. We pray that the wealthier countries like Britain will be generous in sharing vaccines with any nations who can't pay for them and are unable to make their own. We left up to you the many refugees around the world who have been forced out of their own countries because of war, persecution or deprivation. May they know the kindness of strangers and may they be willing to help in may we be willing to help in any way we can. We pray for the volunteers at the Refugee Centre in Croydon who are struggling to support their clients through the pandemic. May they have wisdom and resources to continue this vital service. We pray also for organisations helping the homeless in Croydon, for Nightwatch, The Link in Crisis. And we thank you that Pearly Food Hub has been continuing to support many people in food poverty. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we lift up to you Myanmar after the military coup and arrest of their elected leader, Aung San Suu. We pray for a peaceful resolution, for democracy to be allowed and the wishes of the people fully accepted and respected. We pray that the military will hold back from using destructive force on its own people. We also pray for wisdom for the United Nations as they decide what action they may take. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
As the world gradually adjusts to living with COVID and economies gradually pick up again, we pray that all nations will take climate change very seriously. There have been so many warnings from scientists, ecologists, activists about how near the edge we are. We have seen fires, floods, weather changes with increasing intensity and frequency. 2020 was one recorded as one of the hottest years since records began. We pray that politicians, leaders of business and industry, will make wise decisions and policies to drastically reduce our impact on the earth. And may each of us will actively challenge ourselves as to how we live, what we buy and what we throw away. Lord, help us truly value your wonderful creation and be serious about caring for it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now we lift up to you any of our families, friends, colleagues and neighbours who are struggling with ill health, financial worries, family worries, bereavement and any other pressures that are causing stress, anxiety and pain. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us conclude our intercessions with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Now we enter a time of song worship. He has forgiven us by his mercy. He has fed us by his word and he has received our prayers. I pray that you can now enter his presence and receive the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, to live for him, to love for him, for you are truly loved by him. Amen.
Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. Your church, we need your power in us. We seek your kingdom first, we hunger and we thirst, refuse to waste our lives for you, our joy and prize. To see the captive hearts released, the hurt, the sick, the poor. Just like heaven, when you walk into the room, there's not a thing that's hidden. When every eye is on you, can't get enough of your presence. It's the perfect point of view, isn't it? Just like 
just like, just like hell.